Hi there, I'm Kathleen Jasper, and today I'm talking about the ACT reading exam. We're gonna go over a proven strategy to help you increase your score on this exam, and I'm gonna show you everything you need to crush this test. Now, the strategy I'm gonna show you today for the ACT reading will work for two reasons. First, if you are someone who is trying to increase your score on the ACT so you can get into the college of your choice, this strategy will help you do that in the reading section. This strategy will also help you if you are a student trying to graduate high school using the concordant ACT score for graduation. Let me explain what that means. If you are someone who is struggling to pass your state high school reading exam. In Florida, it's called the FSA reading exam. Other states have different reading exams, but they can be rather difficult and they can prevent you from graduating. So for example, in Florida, if you do not pass the 10th grade reading FSA by the time you graduate, you don't get a standard diploma in the state of Florida, unfortunately. However, you can take the ACT and get a concordance score. Now, the concordance score that you need in order to graduate is an average of 18 with the English and the reading. So what they do is they take your English score and then your reading score, smush them together, take the average, and as long as it's an 18 or over, you can graduate high school with that score. But this strategy will also help you if you are someone who has like a 24 or 25 on the ACT reading and you want to bump that to like a 30 or a 33. I have seen students go from low reading scores on the ACT to Ivy League scores on the ACT just by using this reading strategy. So we've helped lots of students do that. All right, so let's talk about the way in which we are going to attack this test. Now let me show you a really good tool to use while you are studying for the ACT. I love ACT because they release tests every year for you to study from, which is really awesome because then you can practice with an actual test. Now there are books out there. Kaplan makes a great book. Magoosh makes a great book. Barron's, pretty much any testing company makes the book. And it doesn't matter which one you get, but I really like to start with a released ACT test. Now you can get this on the ACT website. I will link it up for you in the description below, but just know this is the 2020-2021 school year released ACT test. You can see up here at the top, it says free, so anybody can access it. And it's basically the entire ACT. It's just like the test you will get on test day. Now, I recommend printing your ACT when you practice because you get it in paper form on test day. It's really good for the reading to have a paper-based test. It's actually easier for a lot of people to read with paper that they can write on and you know take notes on rather than the computer. So that's one advantage you have with the ACT. Now, when I say print this test, I mean print the sections you need. There's a lot of fluff in this booklet. Look here, uh, pages one to, I believe, 12. Yes, one to 12 is all just kind of about the test and all of that. I do encourage you to read it because it does give you background on the test and it's always good to understand more about how the test is developed and all of that. But really what you need to do for this strategy is go straight to the reading section and that's here, section three. So reading on the ACT is always, always, always section three. Now, ACT reading is 35 minutes for 40 questions. Basically, you have four passages, always, always, always four passages and 10 questions per passage. So you can see here, passage number one, it's pretty long, 10 questions, passage number two, 10 questions, and so on and so forth. It goes up to 40, okay? So that leaves you about eight minutes and some change per passage but I'm gonna show you a strategy that's gonna change up that timing a little bit. Eight minutes and some change is not a whole lot of time to read these very lengthy passages and answer all of these questions. So I'm gonna show you how to attack this in a way that saves you time and helps you to be as accurate as possible, okay? So to recap, the ACT reading is always section three on the exam, and it is made up of four passages, 10 questions each 
always. Now, sometimes you'll get a double passage in there, usually just one. Sometimes you won't. And a double passage is those passage A and passage B, and you have questions only about passage A and only about passage B, and then you have questions about both. Sometimes you will have those on the newer ACTs. Usually you will see a double passage on this exam. So be prepared for that. And I have a strategy for that, so don't worry. But that is the gist of the um, reading test. So make sure you remember that 40 questions total, 35 minutes for this section. That means you get eight minutes ish per section, a little bit over eight minutes per section. Now, what I think you should do is print out the reading section and be sure to print out the bubble sheet at the end of the test booklet. On this particular test, it is page 64, okay? You're gonna wanna print out page 64. Now, let me tell you why, and I've done it here. I pulled it off and it's right here. I'll tell you a quick story. When I was first prepping students for the ACT reading, we would just use a book and I would have the students just circle their answers in the book. Now, remember, just circling your answers in the book takes a lot less time than searching for the number, bubbling, over here, okay, this is number 10, bubble, 11, bubble. It takes another two to five minutes per test. So what had happened is I was preparing students and they were just killing it on the reading and they were circling as they went in their book, not bubbling. Well, then when it came to test day, they weren't used to the bubble and it slowed them down and they ended up with a much lower score than they expected and they were very disappointed and so was I because it was my fault. I didn't prepare them properly. So what I suggest you do is always practice in a test-like scenario. So print out this bubble sheet and use it while you practice the exam, okay? So bubble, bubble, bubble. Don't fall into the trap of just circling and you know not simulating the actual testing environment, okay? So I have my bubble sheet here. It is page 64 of the blueprint. I've pulled it off, printed it out. It's next to me and I have my reading test next to me, all right? Now, let's go back to the reading test here. Now, it's really helpful to understand the way the reading is structured and it's always structured the exact same way. So let's hop on over to my screen here. You can see that passage one says literary narrative all the time, every time, doesn't matter when you take this exam, passage one is always going to be literary, which means it's a story, usually from first person narrative, meaning somebody is telling you the story from their perspective. So it has the I and the me and the we. This particular one is about a student who is a swimmer and he's trying to make junior nationals, I believe. So it's a story about that particular experience. Passage two is always going to be social science. Now remember, there are several topics in social science that you, you could get. You could get geography, you could get psychology, sociology, you could get US history, world history. It can be anything that falls under the social science umbrella. In this particular case, this one is about apples and about the regions in which apples are grown, it's very dry and very boring, but it does fall under social science because it has a lot of geography in it and a little bit of like, I think a little archeology span and sociology in there. So that is the apple passage. And this one happens to be a double passage. And I'll talk about that in just a second. The third passage is always going to be humanities, which is another kind of artsy literary passage similar to passage one. So this could be a story type thing, or it could be something about another character. It could be a story about somebody else. It could be first person narrative. It could be third person narrative, but just know it falls under humanities, which is like literature, okay? And then finally, passage four is natural science. Now remember, under the umbrella of science, you could have earth space, biology, chemistry, physics, all of those are fair game when it comes to the natural science passage. This particular one you can see here is about the Milky Way. So I know this is going to be about earth space. Now, that could be interesting to you. Some people, oh, they just are not interested in that. It just depends on the type of student you are and, and what you like to read, okay? So those are the four passages you will always get on the reading ACT. And basically it's structured like this. Arts, science, arts, science. 
Passage one has to do with the arts. Remember, it's a literary narrative. Passage two is science, social science. Passage three is humanities, which is another type of arts and literature. And passage four is natural science, which is science. So arts, science, arts, science. Now that we've gone through the structure of the ACT, let's talk about the strategy. And the strategy I'm gonna show you today has five parts. And remember, when I show you reading strategies, you can't just watch this video and then just apply it on test day. I recommend printing this test and trying this strategy and using it again and again and again in your practice, okay? Not just, oh, Dr. Jasper told me to do this, I'm gonna wait till test day and try it out. Don't wait till test day, do it periodically throughout your practice and it'll get better and better and better and you'll get faster and faster and faster, all right? So we said before, you get 35 minutes for four passages at 10 questions a piece, which means 40 questions total. We also said that you get eight and a half minutes-ish, a little bit less than eight and a half minutes per passage, all right? Now, this strategy has five parts. The first part is the order in which you read the passages. That's really, really important. Remember, we have arts, science, arts, science, right? Well, you might be a person who really enjoys reading literature. You may be someone who hates reading science, or you may be the, the opposite of that. You might be somebody who is really good at reading science, and really terrible at reading literature. It just depends on what kind of student you are, okay? And it's, it doesn't mean anything except preference, okay? So the first part of the strategy is what order you read the passages, okay? The second part of the strategy is the time you give each passage. Now I told you before you get eight and some change per passage, but I'm actually going to show you how to give more time to passages that you read on the front end and fewer minutes on the, t on the passage that you read last. So rather than breaking it up eight and a half, eight and a half, eight and a half, eight and a half, you're going to break it up as 10, 10, 10, and five. You're going to give 10 minutes to the first three passages you read and five minutes to the last passage, meaning you're going to give that a lot of good time to the passages that you know you're going to do really well on and save the five minutes to the passage you know you're not going to do very well on. And I'm going to talk about that more in just a second. The third part of the strategy is reading the questions first. All right, and I know I talk about this all the time, but I'm gonna show you how awesome it is with the ACT reading. It's essential if you want to save time and increase accuracy. The fourth part of the passage is going to be mapping the passage based on the questions. I'm gonna show you how to go in and look at the questions and actually find in the passage where they might be and mark it. I'm gonna show you an example in just a second. And the last part of the strategy is your guessing strategy. I'm gonna show you what to do and what not to do when it comes to guessing. Okay, let's talk about the order of the passages. Like I said before, you might be somebody who enjoys reading literature and who hates reading science, or you could be the opposite. You could be somebody who loves to read science and hate reading literature. You have to determine that yourself. And the way you kind of figure that out is by practicing your reading ACT. You might surprise yourself. You might find yourself to be someone who loves stories, but then as you practice the ACT, you realize you do better on the science. So this is actually going to come to you as you practice the reading, okay? So let's talk about this again. Remember, passage one is literary narrative, a story-like situation. Passage two is social science, something along the lines of geography, psychology, sociology, U.S history, world history. Passage three is going to be humanities, another artsy type passage. And passage four is always going to be science. Now start to figure out kind of right away who you are. Are you a science person or a literary person? I'm going to say that I'm a science person, although I like both. I like to read science and I like to read literature, but I'm a nerd and weird. So, um, it, you might be the same way. You might be someone who likes all of it. So maybe you read it from number one on. But let's say you are someone who loves science, hates stories, okay? So which passage am I gonna read first? Passage four I'm going to read first. I'm not gonna start with passage one, two, three, and leave passage four to last, the one that I would have done the best on. No, I'm gonna read the ones that I know I'm gonna do well on first. That way, if I run out of time, 
then I've left the ones I was gonna do poorly on till the end anyway, and if I guess, it's not gonna be that big of a deal. You always wanna do the things you know well first because you gobble up those points, and it's really important to grab those questions and get those points where you can. So let's say I'm a natural science person, I'm gonna read passage four first. Now please remember, be careful when you bubble. You might be in the middle of testing and go, okay, I'm reading passage four, but you might start bubbling in, pass, in um, passage one, number one. Don't do that. Remember, if you're starting with passage four, you wanna be over here at 31, because 31 to 40 are the 10 questions that go with passage four. So be very careful, remember that. You'll only make that mistake once. In, in your practice. Hopefully you don't make it on test day. Um, if you practice a lot, you will not make that, that mistake on test day. So remember, match the passage to the bubble sheet. Sometimes we get distracted and that's gonna be a long time to erase and redo. So be careful. Check twice, mark once, okay? So I know for sure I'm starting at 31 and I know that I'm reading passage four first. Now what I suggest you do after that is just go back to passage one and then read one, two, and three. So I started with four, which I believe is gonna be my best passage. Then I just go back to number one and read one, two, and three. Three is humanities, and if I'm a natural science person and I don't like stories, then humanities is going to be my last passage and maybe that's my guessing passage and I don't really care about that one, okay? now. You may say, well, I wanna read science first, then social science, then passage one, then passage three. So you essentially would read it four, two, one, three. You can do that, but as long as you practice, okay? Because if you're jumping around like that, you really wanna have a command of the test. Now I do that when I take the ACT practice tests. I jump around to the ones I like, but I've been doing this strategy now for, I don't know, eight, nine years. So I'm very familiar with the strategy and I'm good at it because I teach it to people and I practice it all the time. So if you're gonna jump around like that and go four, two, one, three, make sure you have a command of what's going on. Otherwise, do passage four first, then go one, two, three, just to kind of keep it in order. Now you may be somebody who likes literary narratives first and you wanna read the stories first. Well then start with passage one and just read on through to passage four. Maybe natural science is something you hate reading. You hate reading biology. You hate reading about earth space. Leave that one till the end and go one, two, three. So you can just read it in order. That's fine, okay? So that's the first part of our strategy is the order in which we read and making sure we're bubbling in the right spot if we're mixing up the order, all right? Now, this is where the time comes in and where the order is gonna kind of help you with the time. The second part of the strategy is the time you give each passage. Now remember, I said rather than do eight minutes, eight minutes, eight minutes, eight minutes all the way through, you're actually gonna front load some time. You're gonna read your first three passages at 10 minutes a piece. So 10, 10, 10. The last passage you read is going to be five minutes. Now, if you're a slow reader, and a lot of people are, it's totally fine, you can do 11, 11, 11, and two. And just basically say that third passage is just gonna be like a total guessing passage. You're not even gonna have any time to read it. If you are taking the ACT for graduation, remember, you only need an 18 and that's only 50% correct. So you essentially only have to read two passages, you would have to get 100% on both passages, which is highly unlikely, even for the best reader, you're gonna make a mistake here and there. So let's say even at the end, if you didn't even get to passage four, your, your last passage, you would still have gotten enough correct on the first three because you gave yourself that time, all right? So if you're reading this for graduation, do the 11, 11, 11, two, if you would like, that's fine. Or even more on the first two and maybe the last two passages, you spend a little less time. But if you are someone who's trying to get that, you know, high score for, you know, a, a, a competitive college that you're trying to get into, 10, 10, 10, and five, 
typically has been the secret sauce for us at NavaEd helping students get through this exam, all right? So remember, you're gonna front load on the passages that you know you're gonna do well on, and then you're gonna leave that passage that you know you're not gonna do very well on as your shorter time guessing passage, okay? So that is the first two parts of the strategy, the order and the time in which you give each passage. Now, the third part of the strategy is reading the questions first. And I'm gonna show you how to do that now. I'm actually gonna combine the third part of the strategy and the fourth part of the strategy because they go together, all right? So let's do that now. All right, so now I'm going to show you how to read the questions first and map the passage by using the questions. So this is gonna be the third and fourth part of the strategy, all right? Okay, so let's say that I am that natural science person. I like to read about science. So I have decided I'm gonna start with passage four first, and I've got my bubble sheet next to me, and I'm going to bubble in as I go. Remember, we wanna simulate an actual test, all right? So I'm starting with passage four. The first thing you wanna do is to take a look at the title. Sometimes the title does reveal a little bit of information that helps. First of all, I know this was written in 2003, so I know it's going to be relatively easy to read. Sometimes on the literary passage, you'll look at it and it'll be like 1847. Well, you know that's going to be weird old English kind of jargon and you might want to leave that as your last passage. But if something's written relatively early, like 2003, 1998, whatever it is, you know that the language used is probably going to be modern enough to understand. In this case, we're talking about natural science, so it's probably going to be that way. With the literature and the humanities, sometimes you'll see something from a long, long time ago and you know to leave that for as the last passage, okay? So now I know this is about natural science and I kind of pick up on here without even reading that it's about the Milky Way. So right away in my brain, I see Milky Way, I go, ah, Earth space. This is gonna be about space and stars and the galaxies and, and all of that, all right? Now, most people, they'll start here and they'll start reading all the way down, reading the entire passage and then they go to the questions. And then what do they have to do? go back and reread everything and then answer the question. Then they read another question. Then they go back and reread, right? I'm going to tell you to work backwards from the questions, all right? Okay, so let me give you an example. Let's start with question number 31. Which of the following statements best expresses the main idea? All I need to remember is that I need a main idea brain for this question. What is the main idea? overarching statement, nothing too specific. A lot of times you can answer this question without even reading the passage because three out of the four answers are gonna to be too specific and there's gonna be one general answer. So a lot of times I'll try this out and I will try to answer main idea questions without ever knowing what the passage is about because as you can see here in number 31, we have A, is a little bit um, specific, B is also very specific, C is general, and D is a little bit general, but C is a very general statement. So in a lot of ways, you can answer this question without reading the passage. That's just a little trick, but let's say you didn't know that, all right? I know 31 is about the main idea. Okay, boom, got it. Number 32, it can, ease, it can reasonably be inferred that the problem the author mentions in line 33 refers to. Now this is where the fourth part of the strategy comes in. Notice that they say line 33. I want you to take your pencil, go to line 33, I like to grab a little bit above and a little bit below because you can't always figure out the answer to something unless you read a little bit up and a little bit down. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put number 32 here because I know the answer to question 32 is in that little area that I bracketed off, all right? That's what we call mapping the area, all right? Now let's keep going. 33, it can reasonably be inferred from the passage that the small satellite galaxy referred to in, notice again, we have lines 35 and 36. So I'm gonna go over here, I'm gonna find lines 35 and 36, which is right around here, and I'm gonna say number 33. Now, I have three questions that I can answer just by reading the first 
few paragraphs, the main idea you can probably get after a couple of paragraphs. You can kind of get the gist of the main idea. And you can see that the answer to number 32 is around um, line 30 to 35-ish. And the answer to number 33 is somewhere between 35-ish and 40-ish. I just kind of grab a little bit up and a little bit down. So as I read, I know, boom, I'm in the zone of answer to 32 and the answer to 33. This all takes a little bit of time. But as you do this strategy, you'll be able to map so quickly. In fact, when I teach students this strategy and I time them, they like flip, they're going flipping back and forth, back and forth. They're circling things and doing things before they ever read the passage. And what it does is it makes it for when you do read, you can jump out of the passage, you know exactly where to go to answer the questions and you save time. But again, it takes practice, okay? So let's go to the next page here. And I believe um, the rest of the questions don't mention line numbers, but we still want to read them, all right? So we have here, based on the passage which the following statements best describes Balin's study. Okay, I'm going to keep that in mind. Notice that I'm not reading the answer choices. Why would I do that? Why would I read all of these answer choices here when there are three incorrect answers and only one correct answer? Don't fill your brain up with the incorrect answers. Just read the question stem and look for keywords. Like this says Balin study or Balin, Balin study. When you start reading and you see the words Balin study, it's a trigger to say, oh, that's going to be, I remember that question. All right. It doesn't mean you jump out of the passage right away and answer it. Just keep it in mind. And it always helps to set the purpose for reading. And that's why we're reading the questions first. Then we have 35. According to the passage, Balin discovered that the angular momentum, these are other good keywords, angular momentum of this Milky Way and the angular momentum of the Sagittarius dwarf. So it looks like they're talking about stars here. Um, and again, I don't know what this passage is about. I know it's natural science. I know that it's probably about the Milky Way because it mentioned the Milky Way. And besides that, I don't know what it's about. I'm taking the first steps, which is setting the purpose for reading, which is reading the questions first, okay? And the words angular momentum are pretty specific. So the fact that I read that question first, when the terms angular momentum come up, I'm going to go, ah, yeah, I remember that. I remember that. Write that down or circle or whatever. 36, according to the passage, the central bulge of the Milky Way is comprised of. Well, central bulge is kind of a interesting set of words. So I'm going to keep that in mind as I'm working through this passage. Let's go here. 37, the author refers to the swirling pattern of a hurricane. The word hurricane, swirling pattern of a hurricane will probably jump out at you. So I would underline that. 38, the passage directly compares the Milky Way disk as it is affected by its warp. It's kind of general. I'm going to take warp Milky Way's disk, something like that. 39, according to the passage, which of the following statements best describes the movement of the Sagittarius dwarf? Let's just say movement of Sagittarius dwarf. Let's keep that. Maybe you can't answer that question until later. And then 40, the passage describes, here we have it again, angular momentum as the amount of a system's something. Now notice 35 is about angular momentum and 40 is about angular momentum. So if you come across the terms angular momentum, you might remember to jump to 40 as well and answer that question. Now, this again takes a lot of practice and time, okay? So you're going to want to slow down and practice this. I'm modeling it for you today, so obviously it's taking way longer than it should because I'm showing you this. As you do this strategy, this should only take you like two to three minutes. Then you want to spend that time, the rest of your time reading and answering the questions. I'm telling you, this two to three minutes on the front end is going to save you an enormous amount of time on the back end. What people tend to do is they read from start to finish, then they go and answer questions, and then they have to reread constantly over and over again. If you set the purpose for reading by reading the questions first, which is the third part of our strategy, and you map the passage based on the questions, which is the fourth part of the strategy, you will save valuable time and you will become more accurate. Now, this particular passage only has two questions where lines were mentioned, where I could actually go in and find the line. But some passages will have five or six questions with lines in them. And so already you have six areas in the passage where you know 
answers to questions are. So that's really, really helpful. This one only has two, still very helpful, but it has very specific language, this angular momentum and angular momentum and the swirling hurricane up here in 37. All of those are very specific words and those will help you identify answers as you read the passage as well. Now that you've worked backwards and read the questions first and mapped what you could in the passage and thought about those, you know, crazy words that you see that might jump out at you, now it's time to read. Okay, so now start from the top because you do have some main idea questions. And you're going to need to read the passage in order to get the, the gist of the passage. So I tell people to start reading from the top now. But now you have all this information in your head that you're looking for, which is going to make it easier to answer the questions. So I would start here and don't worry, I'm not going to read to you in this video. I'm going to let you do it on your own. But now I would start at the top and my way of doing it. And you can always modify this when you get to here where numbers 32 and 33 are the answers to the question are because you mapped it. I like to jump out of the passage and go answer those questions. Because remember, you want to grab as many correct answers as you can early so that if time runs out, you've got that. Okay. So I would start reading as soon as I got to here, I would, you know, kind of get the understanding of that. Then I might go to questions 32 and questions 33. I also might be able to answer question 31, which was my main idea question, because by then I have read all of this here, all the way down to here, which means I can probably figure out the main idea by that. Maybe not. So you might be able to do 31, 32, and 33 before even reading more than half the passage. So that's very, very helpful. And some of that angular momentum might be there as well. You might be able to grab another question. So a lot of times the answers to the questions are in the front end of the passage. It's a trick that test makers do. They put a lot of the answers to the question on the front end of the passage because they're hoping you'll read all the way down to here, forget what you read. When you go to the questions, you have to go back and reread, but not if you use the strategy. You will not forget what you read because you're constantly reading jumping out to answer questions, reading, jumping out, and grabbing those correct answers where you can. All right, now before I go on to the last part of the strategy, which is the guessing portion, I want to talk to you about this main idea question right here on number 31, all right? So we have main idea, and let me just zoom in a little bit here for you so you can see it. All right, so we have number 31. It's a main idea question. I want to show you a trick that will help you on all the passages. Pretty much every single passage is going to have a main idea question. Now, what they like to do is they like to make all the answer choices something that has happened in the passage. So in this case, A most likely happened somewhere in the passage, B happened, C happened, and D happened. And so why they the reason why they do that is because as the reader, you're like, well, A was in there and B was in there and C was in there but only one is general enough to be the main idea. Now, remember I said that sometimes I can even answer main idea questions without ever reading the passage. Right away, I can eliminate several answer choices here because they are too specific. Let's take a look at A. Balin began studying the Sagittarius dwarf when he was a graduate student in astronomy. That's going to be hard to be the main idea. That means the entire passage is going to be about Balin's beginning to study about this, this particular star. Sagittarius dwarf is a star. Um, that seems way too specific. That feels like a detail. So if I were taking this exam, I would immediately cross out A. All right, let's take a look at B. The gravitational tidal forces of the Milky Way are destroying the Sagittarius dwarf. It's okay, but gravitational tidal forces, especially if I've already read five or four paragraphs, remember you've read one through four and you may be able to answer the, the main idea. You might realize that the gravitational tidal forces is also too specific and not the main idea. C, most astronomers have come to an agreement that evidence about how galaxies has formed is at best circumstantial. Let me talk to you about C. This is something test makers do as well. C is what we call strong language or strong claims. Notice what it says. Most 
astronomers have come to the agreement. Most astronomers disagree on a lot of things. Scientists disagree. And then it says here um, on the evidence of how galaxies form is at best circumstantial. I would say that that answer choice is full of strong language and I would stay away from it unless it definitely was mentioned in the passage. But I feel like C should be eliminated. D, evidence suggests that the warp in the Milky Way's disks results from the Milky Way's interaction with a small satellite galaxy. Now, Milky Way is all over this. We do have the word Sagittarius dwarf in the passage, but D feels like a main idea because evidence suggests, right? It leaves the door open and D seems to be much more general than A or B. C is very specific with strong language and I eliminated it. D happens to be the answer to this question and I could have probably gotten down to that by not even reading the passage. I don't recommend you do that. I'm just telling you the patterns in these questions you'll start to pick up on as you do this practice over and over and over again. So if you are trying to maximize points, check out those main idea questions and maybe try to answer it. Like if you see a main idea question, just in practice, not in real life, but if you see a main idea question, try to answer it without reading the passage and see if you get it right. And you may, you may have narrowed it down to 50-50 at least, and then it's not too hard to go back into the passage and figure that out because you've narrowed it down. So that's a little trick with the main idea. Now, the last part of the strategy is the guessing strategy. Now, remember, we said you're gonna do 10, 10, 10, and five. You're gonna give yourself a lot of time on the first three passages that you read, and then you're gonna just kind of skim and guess on that last passage. Now, when you are guessing, Please remember to not Christmas tree. If you Christmas tree and answer all different answer choices, and Christmas tree, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure you all know, but that's when you go like A, D, C, D, B, and it kind of looks like a Christmas tree going down, right? You could miss all of the questions that you guess on. My suggestion is you pick a letter a, B, C, or D, it does not matter which one, pick the one that you want to be your guessing letter, and you make that your guessing letter for the entire time you're guessing. So let's say at the end, let me go to my answer sheet here. Let's say that I read passage four first, and then I read one, two, and three. And let's say on the third passage, I run out of time, right? Because I've already read the first three, but the third passage happens to be my last passage. So let's go to, that's gonna be 21 all the way to here. So let's say um, I have this left right here, 24 through 28. Let's say I've read everything else, answered everything else, but the proctor says 15 seconds left, and you know you do not have time to read those questions or answer it. All you have time is to bubble. I say take whatever um, answer choice you're using, so maybe it's B or C, and just go straight down. Take that pencil and go B, 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 all the way down, or D, 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 all the way down, or A, 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 or C, C, C. It doesn't matter which one. Now, what I have some students do who are really good at this strategy, let's say that you have answered all the other questions except for 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. So you have those five questions left. Sometimes, and I do this, and remember it takes um, practice, students will kind of survey their answers that they've already done and try to see if there's any letter that is used too much. Like maybe there are a lot of A's. Don't use A as your guessing letter in this situation. Let's say there are very few C's. Let's say that, that out of all of these, you look and you're like, huh, there's not a lot of C's. Well, these last five questions, do C all the way down because that will help you because remember, A, B, C, and D are evenly distributed across this particular test. So this is test three, section three. So A, B, C, and D are gonna be evenly distributed. That doesn't mean that, you know, 
passage one is going to have the same amount of A's as passage two. It means for the entire section. So you could have a lot of A's in passage one and two and very few C's anywhere else in the passage. So C would be your guessing letter. So hopefully that makes sense. You can look and see which letter is kind of missing and make that your guessing letter. If you don't have time to do that, just pick a letter that you like and just all the way down, same letter, no Christmas tree. With the same letter, you can get more correct than you would if you Christmas treat. All right, now a little something to add to the strategy. You may get a double passage on the exam. Let's take a look. On this particular practice test, the social science section is a passage A, passage B reading section, which means, like you can see here, this is passage A, and then the rest is passage B. This is passage B. Now, what do most people do? They start in passage A, they read all the way down, then they read all of passage B, then they try to answer the questions. I say no. What you want to do is break this passage up into two distinct passages. So you're going to use the same strategy I showed you, except this is going to become two passages. Now, let me show you what I mean. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read numbers 11, 12, and 13 first. On the ACT, they're nice to you when it comes to double passages. They put all the questions for passage A in the front of the questions, all the questions for passage B next, and then at the very end, they have questions for passage A and B. Let's take a look. Notice that the questions for passage A end at 13. And then we start with passage B questions on 14, all right? And that goes all the way to 17. And then finally, 18, 19, and 20 are going to be passage A and B questions. So here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna read all the questions for passage A first. That means 11, 12, and 13. I'm gonna read those first and I'm gonna map my passage. So let's take a look at that. We have on page 11 here, we have lines six through seven, the author's use of the words thickets stretching in every direction, extensive forests, so that's six and seven. So I'm going to go right here, six and seven, and that's going to be number 11, okay? Then I'm gonna flip Go to number 12 and I can see the author of passage A most likely states that the wild apples growing in this area look like apples found in the local grocery store. Well, I don't have a line number there, but I have local grocery store. That's kind of a good word to think about. And then number 13, passage A makes which of the following claims about plant species that are found in Kazakhstan? All right, now that's three questions. So what am I gonna do? I've already finished reading the questions for passage A. Now I'm going to read passage A. Once I get here, I'm gonna jump out, try to answer that question while I can. Keep reading all the way down to here. Once I'm done, I'm not gonna read any further. I'm gonna go in and answer numbers 11, 12, and 13. Done, passage A is done, passage A's questions are done. Now I'm going to read passage B's questions, which start on number 14. Passage B most strongly suggests that this person, I don't know how to pronounce his name, was motivated to become, and we have this agricultural scientist motivated to become. So let's keep that in mind. Number 15, the author of passage B uses the phrase whittle away on line 80. Okay, this is number 15. I'm gonna flip, I'm gonna go to line 80. I'm gonna bracket it out, a little bit above, a little bit below. This is number 15. I know that the answer to that question is in that section. I'm mapping again. 16, as it is used in line 82 to 83, the phrase named and nurtured, okay? Now we have actual things that we're talking about. Line 82 to 83, named and nurtured. Let's go over here. Let me just look for it really quick. And we have it right here named and nurtured, that's gonna be number 16. Number 17, in passage B, it can most reasonably inferred from the third paragraph in lines 74 to 79, centers of crop diversity. They even give you some words to underline there. So this is number 17 and it's in number 74 to 79. So we're gonna grab this 
and we're going to put number 17. Look at already, I have three questions here. Well, how many questions do I have for passage B? Three. The only questions for passage B, and let's flip to the questions really quickly, are 14, 15, 16, and 17. Sorry, there are four questions for passage B. Notice that 15, 16, and 17, three out of the four, can be answered in this area just right here. Now, you can do one of two things. You can start there and try to answer those questions. I say I like to read everything because some of this stuff is context. So I personally would probably start with the top, you know, with the start of passage B and start reading because probably some of this all over here is going to be important. But you could also, if you're someone who doesn't want to do that and you want to just grab those three questions, you could start reading right here on uh, starting with number seven or line 74 all the way down and get those three questions. But you still have question 14 you got to do, and that's going to be a little bit above. So it's up to you through practice. You can decide how you want to do that. But again, notice by mapping the passage, there are three out of the four questions for passage B right here in those last two paragraphs. And so you might be able to answer those. I need context, so I need to read a little bit more than just the area in which the um, answers are. But you decide as you go through this. Now, finally, you can see here, we have 18, 19, and 20. Because I have read the questions first, read the passage, then answered the questions, then read the questions, read the passage, answered the questions, now I have a very good understanding of both passages. I've been in and out, I know the questions, I know the structure, I know everything that's going on. Therefore, questions 18, 19, and 20 are going to be a breeze. Now, let me point you to number 18. This happens a lot in double passages and this is gonna help you as well. Notice that they have passage A is defensive, whereas passage B is dispassionate. A lot of people get caught up here it's asking, what is the difference in tone in the two passages? All you have to do is do process of elimination here. This happens a lot on the ACT. Notice passage A is defensive. Defensive is a very strong word. And I've read these already. I've read this test a hundred times. So I know that passage A is not defensive. I don't even have to read the second part of this question here about being dispassionate because I know right away that passage A is not defensive. So I can cross off F right away. G, passage A is solemn. This means sad. Solemn means sad. These are both very strong emotions. Again, G is not the answer because passage A is not sad. Now we're down to H and J. Passage A is celebratory, whereas passage B is cautionary. And then J, passage A is accusatory. Another strong word, which it is not. Um, passage A is not accusatory. Notice that how much easier it is to answer that question just by going through defensive, solemn, celebratory, accusatory. F, G, and J are all incorrect. Passage A is none of those things. It is not defensive, not solemn, and not accusatory. So H is my answer. I mean, that's how easy it is. Process of elimination, saving time will get you that accuracy you need and get you those points you need. All right. So that is the strategy for the double passage. You're basically going to apply these four principles in the, you know, single passage strategy, but you're going to do it for the double passage strategy for each part of the passage. You're going to treat passage A as its own passage with its own questions and passage B with its own as its own passage with its own questions. And then, you know, the last three questions will be a combination. But I'm telling you, if you break up double passages like that, you will do very well on the double passage. A lot of people get nervous about those double passages, but doing this way really makes it a lot easier. It actually chunks it out very, very effectively for you to retain that information and to do it quickly and effectively on the exam. And again, don't forget about your guessing. If this is your last passage and you just decided I'm leaving the double passage to the end or I'm leaving this awfully boring passage about apples till the end, then you would do the guessing strategy where you use the same letter for the entire thing that you're guessing. So if there are five questions left over here that you cannot answer, then you take your pencil and it's all the way down, same letter, all the way down, no Christmas tree. Now let's talk about the answers. 
you're definitely going to want to check your answers. And it's not enough just to check your answers. Oh, I got this one wrong. Oh, I got this one right. You really want to pay attention to why you got it wrong and why you got it right. Because you may be making the same mistakes over and over again. Maybe it's the main idea that you're not understanding. Maybe you're choosing things that are too specific. It's really important that you analyze that and understand that. Maybe it's the vocab. Maybe it's the tone. Maybe it's the double passage that throws you up. Whatever it is, make sure you're analyzing your answers. Don't just say correct, 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 incorrect, correct. Even analyze why you got something correct, because knowing why you did something correctly is going to help you do that again and again and again. And of course, understanding why you're doing something wrong will help you fix that problem. So it's not enough just to score your test. You got to see why you got it incorrect. And a lot of times it's like, oh, I didn't pay attention to that one little word in there or this one little meaning. And then you know next time not to do that. Now, your answers to the test in the free packet that is given to you by ACT it's towards the end. On this particular test, you can see here, the first part, this is for the English. Reading is the third test, as you can see here, and it is on page 59 for this particular test, okay? It varies. It might be on page 57 for other released ACTs. It just depends. But make sure you check your answers and be sure to analyze why you got things correct and why you got things incorrect. Now I have one recommendation when it comes to studying for the reading ACT, or any test for that matter. Incremental practice over time beats cramming one day or five days before the exam, all right? So what I recommend you do is you read one passage a day. That's about 20 minutes of work a day. Give yourself 10 minutes to read the passage and answer the questions. So in those 10 minutes, you are going to read the questions, map the passage based on the questions, read the passage, and then answer the questions. You should give yourself 10 minutes to do that. Then what you need to do is give yourself another 10 or 15 minutes to score it and analyze your answers. If you do that every day, once a day, for 14 days, 20 days, 30 days, watch your scores go up. Watch your reading get so good that this becomes super easy for you. Now, if you're one of those people who really wants to simulate this test and you wanna do the whole thing, what I recommend you do is you do that incremental practice first and get the strategy going and then do a full reading practice. Now, you can get more reading practice. I'm gonna show you that before the end of the video, but I do recommend breaking it up initially and getting this strategy going. So just do one passage a day, get the strategy going. And then after like five days or even four days, if you wanna do a full reading and like time yourself and try to do exactly what we said based on the time, you can do that. But I recommend incremental practice, one passage per day scoring it and analyzing your answers over longer periods of time, one to two. If you wanna do two passages a day, that's good too. Um, but if you do wanna do a full reading, remember that's a full 35 minutes, you most likely will not make it in time your first time. That's why I'm saying practice the strategy before you do a full simulated reading exam. Now you might be asking, where can I get more ACT tests? Glad you asked. All you have to do is Google released ACT tests. And when you do, you will see this blog come up, Prep Scholar. We are not affiliated with this blog, but I love it. I read it all the time. They have really good information in it. And they have here, I think it's six, yes, six released ACT tests right here, free for you and answer keys. So there is plenty of reading practice right here on this blog. Now, again, we're not affiliated with them, but I go here to pull those ACTs and these are released ACTs by the company. So the company has released these so people can use them. They are free and this will really help you to simulate that practice. So I hope that clears things up for you today about the ACT reading. Use this strategy, practice it, and try to increase your score on the ACT. Let us know how you're doing in the comments, and if you have any questions, let us know. Be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel and hit the notifications button so you're notified when we upload new content. Thank you so much for watching, and have an awesome day.